The story of Reddit user Spontaneous H, who documented his heroin addiction, is well known, but there are various other similar cases, like the one we'll cover today, Bloodshot Eyes, whose story is even more in-depth and tragic. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. I also have a Patreon and a PayPal, so if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to check those out through the links in the description, or you can leave me a tip by clicking thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will delve into drug addiction and is generally quite depressing, so viewer discretion is advised. You can head over to my Patreon for an uncut version of this video which features extra disturbing details. This video is sponsored by Fetch Rewards, a super easy to use app that allows you to earn rewards on your purchases from any shop, restaurant or website. And I mean literally any store. It's not just restricted to large businesses or chains, so whether you do your shopping at Walmart or a small local store, you'll still get points. All you have to do is download the app and scan your receipts. It can be either physical receipts or e-receipts. You can connect your email and Amazon accounts to the Fetch Rewards app to make submitting receipts even easier. You'll earn points that you can then trade in for a variety of gift cards, including Amazon, Starbucks and many more. The app also contains various special offers that allow you to earn even more points on certain brands and products. Now you can feel a little bit less regret when you impulse buy something in the early hours of the morning like I often do. It takes a matter of seconds and you really can't go wrong with it. And the best part is it's totally free to use, so you really have nothing to lose. You can even get 5,000 points when you scan your first receipt by clicking the link in the description and using the code Internet Investigator. This is a limited time offer for my viewers, so I'd highly recommend downloading the app now and giving it a try. Thirteenth of July 2009, the date that an internet user who called himself Bloodshot Eyes created a profile on Freak.no, a Norwegian forum site that centers around discussion on topics related to science and research and other subjects. He didn't start posting until February 2012, at which point he had evidently dabbled in recreational drug use, but didn't appear to be wearing rose-tinted glasses, as some do. He didn't glorify them or make wild claims about the potential health benefits. In fact, he was actually quite skeptical of their use in medicine, and one of his first comments was on a thread about research that suggested LSD can help with alcohol addiction. He noted that while LSD isn't as dangerous as many think it is, he'd been, quote, rump ridden in the skull by even as little psychedelic drug as cannabis, and so the potential damage should not be underestimated. He also applied this to various other drugs too. There are numerous comments from him either discouraging people to try them, or at least warning them of the risks, both physical and psychological, knowledge that appears to have come from his research and his own personal experiences. Over the following months, in addition to his opinion on other topics he seemed interested in, like computers, religion and politics, we get a clearer picture of his experience with illegal substances. He had occasionally smoked cannabis for over three years. He mentioned that he had tried amphetamine and various pills, though doesn't specify which. At one point, after talking about how cannabis can make people lose their personalities and that the disadvantages outweigh the benefits, he says that if he could live again, he'd stick to alcohol. June 2013 was where things began to take a worse turn. Bloodshot made a post in which he stated he planned to take some heroin and was asking what the best method was. It's not clear whether or not this was the first time he had tried it, though if he had taken it before, he clearly wasn't an experienced user. Yet. A couple of months later, he made it clear that he planned to take it a few times in the future, but insisted that many people can try it without becoming addicted. 
The following month, he said he had taken it maybe 20 to 30 times within the space of two to three months and quit without any problem, apart from mild physical withdrawals. This is of course quite worrying from an outsider's perspective. That works out at least twice or three times a week, and while it's good that at this point he's not actually addicted, and he seems fairly certain he won't be, it would only be a matter of time until that changed. In October, he made a post asking for advice on how to inject, asking questions like what size syringe to use and what ratio the mix should be. One or two users tried to dissuade him, but he said he'd already done it twice before, the other 20 to 30 times he took it in a different way. One of his comments read, I've been using heroin sporadically for almost six months, shot two times with help. I feel pretty sure this is a drug I'm not going to lose control of. It was a week where I drove on every day and got to taste the withdrawals when I finished. Since then, I've never taken more than two days in a row. I'd love to test opium, but I don't have access. Around a month later, he announced that he had managed to keep his use in check, apart from one to two weeks. I'm not sure if he means he only used it those times, or if he used it habitually through this time and on occasions had taken more. Either way, it doesn't exactly sound like he is keeping his use in check at this point, and even admits to being high while at work. Understandably, other users were concerned, and around a week later, he commented, I appreciate your concern, folks. Since this thread has become a kind of potential junkie in the making documentary, I thought I'd give an update. Has become somewhat physically dependent, catches a medium to strong cold when I go two to three days without. It's not unbearable, but when I'm performing poorly at work because of anxiety, which was there before the heroin, it's easy to excuse me for just taking a little. Something else I've noticed is that I don't bother writing on the forum or chatting with people unless I have something inside. As a rule, I use only two to three days a week, so my schedule is to have a chill half the week and then shit the rest. Since my consumption is so low, it's not too hard to quit or take breaks, but the problem is I don't feel like it. At housework, I'm still good at. After Friday, I'm going to try my hand at a break until Christmas Eve. Bloodshot now seemed to be acknowledging that he could be on a slippery slope, and other users were also worried, with one saying, This thread is sad. I know this isn't the forum for morality preachers, but think carefully about whether that's how you want your life. As it sounds, this is only going to go one way, and deep down you're aware of it. Classic to think I'm going to quit after next time. If you honestly think you can quit now, do it. Another comment read, not to be disrespectful, but for everyone, this thread appears as an insight into a person who is descending into the abyss. In January 2014, Bloodshot was still using heroin and decided to update those who were following the post. It's very little that has changed in my life after a few months of injecting the drug. I guess the reason for that is because I have money and a place to live, and I didn't have a rewarding life. I'd actually say I'm better off now, because my mood is going in waves, rather than a monotonous streak on the bottom as it was before. This will change when the tolerance gets bigger, and I just use not to get sick, but I feel I still have a bit until I reach that point, since I can easily go one to two days without getting specified badly. Physically, I've lost a few kilos because I've stopped exercising and eat a little less. Starting to get fewer veins to shoot in, which is a bit of a bad thing. Should have taken better care of them at first. I feel a bit silly writing a blog here, but people now seem interested, so what the hell. The following month, Bloodshot finally admits that he is addicted and plans to quit, though still wants to have what he calls a casual relationship with heroin once he's over the withdrawal stage. I've obviously never tried heroin, but as someone who has smoked for a few years, I can relate to the mentality of wanting to quit, knowing I should quit, but still not being able to shake the feeling of wanting to be able to do it casually in the future. I think of times now where a cigarette simply passes some time for me, like if I'm waiting for a train, or when it de-stresses me after a long day, and it's hard to envision a future where I totally quit and have to replace that with something else, or just nothing. I can't even imagine how much stronger this feeling would be when it comes to such an addictive drug that puts you in a totally different state of being. Bloodshot has still managed to continue going to work. In fact, he says he finds it easier to wake up in the morning because he's using the ultimate sleep medication and he has major sleep problems, but the fact he's spending all his money on it seems to be motivating him to want to quit. The next update he posted was in April, at which point he had been clean for three days and two hours. 
Not a huge amount of time, but a start nonetheless. He has already noticed some benefits, including regaining feelings and enjoying music more, and acknowledges that there's something great about being sober, and that this was the point he had to stop before it went all the way to hell. He says he was lucky to get away with just a slight addiction and only a few damaged veins, and if you're worried that he might be speaking a bit too soon, you're right to be, as he cracked and used again just two days after that comment. It's truly depressing to get the sense that he knows he's in too deep at this point, even if he still seems somewhat convinced that he can still get clean. He's well aware of the problems with long-term use and that it's unsustainable as he'll eventually run out of veins and have to start injecting into the muscle, which carries a higher risk of infection. But at this point, he's using simply to function relatively normally. As is the case with many addicts, Bloodshot was caught in a vicious cycle of getting clean for a few days, then relapsing. In August, he commented, He's now on day four clean or something. I haven't been able to hold the count. I sit on the computer until now. Must almost laugh at how naive I was at the start of this thread. The worst thing about heroin isn't really sucked, but it changes the way you think. I want to be a junkie. Compared to my otherwise labour life, life as a junkie was much more exciting. And the ruse, of course, was a big plus. I know that for the rest of my life, I will have the urge to buy every time I am in the center. The worst thing right now is that I can't eat. Just got in me half an apple though, which was awesome. Otherwise, I should have given everything to be able to eat myself well and full without vomiting it up afterwards. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to stay clean going forward. Subutex is my only solution. It is quite tragic that a year of substance abuse at H will lead to an eternal life on A preparations for Mena. So to those who were in my situation a year ago and sniffed a few quartets here and there, just stop now. Heroin is so hot, it tears away every other joy in your life. We don't know many details about Bloodshot's life, but it sounds like curiosity was at least partly responsible for him trying the drug in the first place. We can infer that while he may have had mental health problems, nothing hugely traumatic was happening to him that made him want to escape, but that his life was simply mundane, and he craved some excitement, and now he was hooked on the thrill. Returning to normal, boring life just didn't seem appealing at all. There was no longer such a thing as simple pleasures in his life as nothing compared to the feeling he got when he was high, which he later described in some detail. On a big dose, you jump in and out of dreamland, Negative thoughts do not exist. In fact, there is very little thinking going on during the intoxication at all. I guess the only thing is these dreams that you jump in and out of. You know when you're in half sleep, it's like that, only a hundred times better. And what makes it so addictive is that you can go from being sicker than most people have never been to the condition I described in over five seconds when shooting. This all highlights the problem with even trying such potent substances. Sure, there are people out there who have tried it once and never felt the need to again, or people who are able to use it recreationally without getting addicted, but I don't think it's ever worth taking that risk. It's not like you're necessarily going to become addicted the second you consume it, but one time is all it can take to knock down the first domino. For people who use drugs to self-medicate physical or psychological conditions, it can be even harder to quit, because it doesn't just mean returning to normal, boring life, but to sometimes unbearable pain. It's thought that one of the reasons behind Kurt Cobain's well-documented addiction was his chronic stomach pain, as well as mental health problems, and we all know how that ended. I digress. Back to Bloodshot. He at least temporarily seemed to have reached breaking point, he said he didn't have a choice anymore, he had to stop, and so he tried to go cold turkey, then ended up using Subutex again. Sadly, but unsurprisingly, he only lasted five days before he cracked, but vowed again to give sobriety another try. The next relevant post revealed he managed to stay clean for six days and was feeling good, aside from sweating at night and a reduced appetite. In September, he updated the original thread after he had been to rehab, quote, I wish I could say I've been sober for 50 days, but I went on a couple of cracks after I got home, but now I've been clean for another week. This is what it's looked like to me since I finished 51 days ago. Day 1. Downturn for what's in store. Day 2. Bad. Sweating. Zero food. No energy. Day 3. Just as bad, but got in me a yoghurt or two. Day 4. Slightly better. Day 7, almost completely physically healthy, but still hungry. Day 10, 
The appetite is way back and the cold sweats have given up. Day 14, into rehab, was really quite disappointed with the whole thing. I don't know if it's right to call it rehab because it felt like a child welfare emergency. A lot of people were through BV there. It was maybe an hour a day that can be called treatment. The rest was work, school and lurking. The first days were pretty damn good since I was struggling with sleep and wasn't used to getting up on. Day 21, sleep is okay. Day 38, leaving rehab as planned. Had to discharge me three weeks before I could leave. Would have been wanted if I left before that. So that day I had waited for a given. I was a little unsure if I was going to do drugs when I got back to Oslo, but then I meet my regular dealer in the city centre randomly. Then it was done. Day 39, takes heroin and Rivotril for a few days to come. Because of Riva, I hardly remember a shit, so it was reasonable when I think about it. Day 44, ends again. Got some withdrawals, but no big deal. Day 51 is today. Doesn't actually have a very big drug craving, thinking that being healthy has now become normal. Before it cost me 30,000 to stay healthy for 50 days. It's a reasonable chill. Otherwise, I'm wondering what the f I'm going to do moving forward. Now I'm in my early 20s with zero work experience on my resume. I guess I'll get an internship and work my way up. What am I doing on a day? I think I'm going to handle it fine. If it's a complete crisis, I guess I'll just have to put a shot. I don't want to go through that withdrawal hell again, so even if I walk on a crack, I probably won't drag it any further than a couple of days. Now you're probably thinking, this guy here never learns. But the thing is, I can't close the heroin door for good yet. As long as I can think, maybe I'll take a little in a couple of months, I'll be fine. But I'd be lying if I told you I'd never touch it again. I'm pretty sure this is the first time that Bloodshot reveals roughly how old he is, early 20s, and that makes this whole situation so much sadder. Not only because he's experiencing such a tough situation at such a young age, but also because the majority of his life is still ahead of him, and that's a long time to have to abstain from something so addictive once you've already been hooked. Once again, we see that he feels helpless and not very optimistic that he will be able to get to a point in his recovery where he never uses heroin again. Nonetheless, the next time he tries to quit goes more successfully. He has a couple of minor slip-ups, but attributes that to the ritual of buying and injecting. He didn't actually become intoxicated because the subutex inhibits the effect of heroin. He notes that his addiction has made other things, like alcohol, much less enjoyable, though he's trying to focus on other things, like hobbies that he had before. However, they don't even come close to scratching the itch that his problem has left him with. He says, Things seem a bit pointless, now my biggest motivator and love are gone. He's now unemployed, presumably due to the effects of his addiction, though he doesn't go into much detail on that. By this point, he had been using heroin for around two years. He'd interacted with other addicts in various stages of recovery on the forum, notably one user who went by the name Tough Tom. Tom had been intoxicated daily on various drugs for around a decade, before briefly quitting, then relapsing, and decided to share his experience. Here are some excerpts from his purse. I've been intoxicated every day, and then I really mean every day, for many years all the time, on everything. I've never been an adult, working, responsible, caring, or otherwise good. I've never failed to do anything I must do and am prepared for, and the rest of my life depends on me doing this. But what the hell happens after that? I am, to be honest, terrified of who is left behind when the drugs leave the body and the truth comes to light. Am I going to be completely destroyed? Am I going to be able to start a life where not only am I sober, but actually have to work at work as well as socially? I often feel that the person I've become over the years of intoxication is someone I would much rather be than who I was before. When I first quit heroin last summer, the withdrawals weren't so terrible. or oh, they felt terrible there and then, but compared to what I had in store, it was baby food. After 24 hours, the puke and gutter came, but no more than two to three days later, I was able to function like this. The suction was enormous, and only thanks to the situation, I stayed sober for a week. As soon as I got the opportunity, the use began in the small, tiny every day, turned into tiny more, and suddenly I realised once again that I was addicted. 
Its use escalated with the exception of some very short detox rounds and in January it reached its extreme point. The fight against the withdrawal was simply too extensive and consequently detoxing was done in several stages. Between each of the rounds, of course, I fell back a little, resulting in me quitting a handful of times. Even as the strength of withdrawal fell with the dose, the trend remains surprisingly consistent and this is the one I want to write a little about here. Zero hours, the last dose is ingested. Six to ten hours, the form is falling and the first symptoms apply at the same time that the thoughts are nothing more than getting more heroin. The pupils expand, the abdomen begins to twist and the hairs on the whole body stand straight out. Eleven to fifteen hours, now the real race begins. A last meal is possible to push down, which is recommended, even though soon it will come up again. Every calorie you get in is worth gold, because for the next couple of days, eating is impossible. You might be able to sleep a little too, just as gold worthwhile. The skin begins to burn, while the chills increase in strength. 16 to 20 hours. Now the intestines are completely standing, and it feels like the body is dying. The vomit begins, and it does not give up until the last drop of stomach acid has come out. Day 2. Even though heroin withdrawals are extremely short-lived and the body is just getting healed, it just feels worse and worse. Eating is impossible, and I mean impossible. Even a glass of water is far too much. It returns after 5 minutes. Sleep is just as impossible, but you can't take anything either. All you want is to lie in a fetal position, at the same time you are indescribably restless. The thoughts are all about heroin. The stomach feels like a hole, and incredibly, the body manages to dehydrate itself so much that you are even forced out of bed. Just going to the bathroom is heavier than the three mile in the military. Foster position in the shower is the only thing that can remind you to feel good, but in return you are too weak to dry yourself afterwards. Day 3. Fatigue and dehydration are total. It's even impossible to sleep properly, but a kind of interpsychotic dream state is achieved occasionally. The dreams aren't nightmares, but all you want is for them to end. All attempts to ingest food result in vomiting, but if only 5% of the one yogurt you almost managed to eat is taken up, it is better than nothing. The skin begins to get hard and scaly, and after three days awake in bed with tremendous restlessness, all you want to do is something. But you can't take anything. Fostering in the shower was the closest I could get. The first meals are now starting to be fairly in place. There's probably three to four pieces of chips, an oat biscuit with lots of jam, or something else you'd refer to as a mouthful otherwise. While the physical stresses have now decreased considerably, the mental stresses are only increasing. A weird, quasi-psychotic depression, in which you are exhausted and lie crying for no reason, and fantasize about s is the closest I come to describing it. Day 5. Now I could sit upright, even watch some TV. Life still sucks, but at least you feel like the tunnel has an end. The first real sleep is a fact, though extremely short-lived. Short walks are possible. Here I mean that hell is over, and what remains after that is three to five days of lethargy, bad appetite, loose stomach, depression, insane cravings for heroin, constant goosebumps, sudden crying, and not least a huge resuscitation for all forms of communication. This description of the first five days of detox allows us to somewhat understand why Bloodshot usually only lasts a few days before relapsing. In fact, he said this post was the most precise description of withdrawal in his experience. For him, it takes 14 days to feel completely physically normal, although the psychological effects and the cravings last much longer, probably to some extent for life. Bloodshot continued to keep trying and went to rehab two more times, in April 2015, after relapsing once again, he unsuccessfully attempted to take his own life, which gave him a reality check and he was set on giving life another chance, before relapsing again. I probably sound like a broken record at this stage, I could have summarised a lot of this by simply saying he got clean then relapsed X amount of times, but telling the story chronologically as he did brings us as close to understanding his situation as we'll ever get, and really emphasises the cycle that each time he cracks becomes harder and harder to break out of. He went cold turkey again for 15 days before taking Subutex and signed up for rehab a fourth time, money still appearing to be a big motivator as he estimated he had spent over £30,000 on heroin since he started using. 
In response to a comment noting that you don't take addiction seriously enough until you've experienced it, he said, At the beginning of the thread, I saw this as a game. It may sound strange, but I wish I could have lived the first couple of months with heroin over and over again. It was just fun. The excitement of buying, sitting on the bus with the drugs in my pocket on the way to the lady was almost as hot as the drugs themselves. Come out, boil up, and know that in two minutes I'll have one of the best nights of my life. Then comes the time when you have to pay for all the pleasure heroin gave you. It's not that cool. Forgot to answer if I regret it. Right now I'm doing it. If in the future I manage to have been clean for several years, I will see it as an experience and a period in my life with many good and bad memories. Around three weeks later, he posted another update. Been on Subutex for almost two months now. I've taken heroin seven or eight times in that day. I think Subutex sucks really, but I don't have a chance to stay clean without it, so I guess it's the lesser of two evils. A common B effect of Sub is that you get passive. I feel nothing, even less than I usually do, care about nothing, and don't bother. The days mostly go to dull in front of your PC. The times I've stayed opiate free for two weeks, I have a much bigger spark, but with Sub, you get all the bad effects of opiates without any of the good ones. Some of them are even worse on the Sub, actually. On heroin, I was useful in bed, but now I have to skip one day if I want to. Also has no urge to exercise or other physical activity. The times I've cracked, it's really just because I want to. It's not like I desperately need heroin. Over the next few months, Bloodshot sporadically commented on various threads, mostly drug-related, but there wasn't much in the way of updates about his personal situation. I imagine that those who followed him at the time were simply relieved to know that he was still alive. The next update was in December, at which point he had been clean for two months, taken up hobbies again, started going to school, then worried he developed an illness from his addiction and cracked again. Six months later, he still hadn't been able to stay clean for long, quote, Been without Subutex for a week and without heroin for three days. Some shit heroin is. And the worst part is that once I have it and I'm high, it's not even very hot. Getting too lax to do things I want to do just stays on my PC like a zombie. Friends, ladies, family, hobbies, really everything that's supposed to matter in life loses meaning. And frankly, I feel like I've lost meaning when I've been sober for a while too. Months. Am I fucked for the rest of my life? The effects of heroin gradually change. I remember one of the first times I injected late one night in central Oslo. I sat on the tram on the way home and thought, this is how I will feel forever. But no, there's something going on in your head, maybe something about testosterone levels or something. If you use opiates regularly, the production of it is hindered and you become a little less manly and driven, you might say. But when I've been sober for a week or two, I forget all this. I'm just thinking, a shot, it's going to be just like the old days. No ass, it's just a disappointment every time. I have now been admitted to treatment six times. Six. I never thought I'd be the type to fly in and out of rehab, but here I am. I'm still a little drugged up, but luckily it wasn't the biggest intake I've had before I finished, so it's not that bad. But still, it's pretty bad. In October, there was another update. I haven't had much good news, and because about 50% of the time, I doubt there's any way out of this. 50% isn't too bad, really. Since the last time I've been clean for two months, two separate times, and a week here, a week there, but the two plus two months have been the only bright spots. The rest has been a hell of a place where I'm either drugged or high. Even when I'm fresh as a fish, without withdrawal, it kind of never lets go. Not only rusing, but after overdosing a lot of times, both intentionally and unwillingly, a deadly MPD seems more and more tempting. But since I've already tried and failed, I've put that idea on the shelf. I don't want to wake up like a vegetable or lamb, and I've probably already lost a couple of billion brain cells. What I do almost feels like masochism. I've suffered since I started this thread, and yet I go back. And the worst part is that when I relapse, it's not that damn hot anywhere. Regrets usually before the rush has given up. Now I feel like I've reached a point where I have nothing more to say than drugs are bad, okay? Should have elaborated on what the two plus two months were like. I had no spark of life at all, although I followed the typical advice, but not as much as I should. I got to training occasionally, but most of the day was spent in bed on my PC, where, among other things, I read on opiate forums to try to live the life I missed through their descriptions. 
Not a smart thing to do, in other words. The highlight of the week was alcohol, only a couple of times a week, but still. Today I'm three days clean, and if I get through the mud this time and live the sober life as it is recommended to the point and dot, then maybe I have a more positive update when it should come. Throughout his post, we've seen Bloodshot go from someone who is naive enough to believe he could try heroin and not get addicted, to someone who is totally addicted and has gradually lost hope that he will ever recover. It's clear that his mood is at an all-time low now, he just doesn't enjoy life enough to want to carry on living, but he's worried if he tries to take his own life again that he'll be unsuccessful and unable to do anything for himself. I'm sorry to say that this was his last update. What followed was a slew of comments from users who were worried about his safety, wondering if he'd taken some time out to focus on his recovery, or if he had finally succumbed to his addiction. In August 2018, a user who claimed to know Bloodshot in real life said that they tried to contact him and even tried searching for him in the places he usually hangs out, but they were unable to reach or locate him and noted that his family hadn't heard anything in months. A few days later, they confirmed that he was alive and hinted that something had happened, but that he should explain that himself. Unfortunately, he never would, and it would turn out that this user was wrong, either mistaken or intentionally lying. An article posted by another user in May 2019 revealed that Bloodshot, real name Paul, had sadly died over a year ago. The link to the article is broken, but it was pasted into the comments. The exact date of his death is unclear, as the article states it was in October 2017, though a comment was posted from the Bloodshot account three months after that. Regardless, the author had interviewed Paul's parents and his ex-girlfriend, providing further context to the story we'd only heard his side on. Paul was a happy boy with a relatively normal childhood. He skied and played football until his teens when he started to lose interest and instead focused his attention on music, learning guitar and becoming a fan of Bullet For My Valentine, whose song Tears Don't Fall inspired his username Bloodshot Eyes. During high school, he and his friends started smoking cannabis and his parents noticed a change in his behaviour, though didn't realise it was because of that at first. Interestingly, Paul had debated with other users on the forum about whether cannabis really is the gateway drug to others, and while I'm sure that question totally depends on the person, it seems to have been for him at least. It sounds like Paul's mental health was in a worse state than he had revealed online. His parents knew he was depressed, but thought he was coping, doing better even, but in actuality, he had started using heroin. They eventually found a syringe in the bathroom and tried every approach they could think of to help him kick the addiction. They tried to persuade him to go to rehab, got him involuntarily admitted, locked the doors overnight to try and prevent him from leaving the house to buy more drugs, and after all this, as a last resort, tried to focus on de-escalation methods. They drove him to buy heroin on the condition that he stuck to the dose they agreed on, desperately clinging to their last bit of hope that there was still a way out for him. They revealed that he had threatened to take his own life on more than one occasion if they didn't give him money for drugs, and so they always reluctantly caved. Paul had mentioned his paranoia in his post, but his ex-girlfriend Ida provided some more detail, including that he started obsessing over conspiracy theories, likely because he spent so much time on his computer alone, combined with drug use of course. The final shred of hope for Paul's family was when he was accepted into a treatment program at Manifest, though there would be a three-month wait. He tried to keep him motivated throughout this time, but he kept relapsing, each time promising that would be the last time, until the day before the program started. They were asking him what he wanted to pack, when he simply told his mother, I'm not going to Manifest. I can't help but wonder, if Paul was able to start this program immediately, would he have finally succeeded, or would this rehabilitation effort have ended in the same way as others before it? That's a question his parents have to live with for the rest of their lives, and probably at least somewhat blame themselves for not being able to get him through that time, or persuade him to go when the time came. One night, Paul's mother returned home and had what she described as a good conversation with him. She noted that he was calm and thoughtful, as he often was. The next morning, they were all supposed to attend a meeting to arrange further treatment, but when Paul's father knocked on his bedroom door, there was no response, so he walked into the room and found his son unconscious. Resuscitation efforts were futile, and Paul was soon pronounced dead. An autopsy revealed that he had taken his own life and was totally sober at the time, presumably having realised death was the only way to end his addiction. 
Paul's parents weren't aware that he was documenting his journey online until the site that published the article showed them the forum. I can't even imagine the heartache they experienced reading through all that. If the article is a true reflection of their feelings, the parents cared deeply about their son, and while it must have been a very traumatic ordeal, in which many would struggle not to lash out at others, they don't pass judgement on the dealer who sold Paul the heroin, acknowledging that he may well have been an addict himself, and that he was likely desperate to be in such a situation. You might be wondering what happened with Tough Tom, the user that had been an addict for a decade and posted about withdrawal symptoms, I wish I could say his story ended differently to Paul's and that he found a way to kick his addiction, but honestly, I have no idea, seeing as he hasn't been active on the forum since October 2021, and he's far from the only user on the site that documented their addiction, then disappeared from the internet. Bloodshot's posts are a haunting read knowing what happened to him in the end, and they serve as a tragic reminder that while certain recreational drugs can be taken occasionally without any serious consequences, particularly when it comes to drugs like heroin, it's all too easy to fall into the pit of addiction, and once there, many never find their way back out. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Do you personally have experience with addiction, or are you aware of any other stories similar to this one? If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. You can also check out other disturbing internet stories I've covered by clicking the i in the top right corner, or in the end screen or description. Huge thank you to my patrons, whose names are on screen now, I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.